Hello everyone, welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Today we are talking about something that's really important for our games going forward. We are talking about collision detection and resolution. So, um, I don't think I have any announcements today, so we can jump straight into the lecture. Uh, my uh, stream deck seems to not be working, so I'm going to have to manually switch my scenes over here. That shouldn't be too much of a problem, because today is all about the slides. So, all right. Lecture number eight, collision detection and resolution. And as part of that, we're going to be talking about axis-aligned bounding boxes. So you've seen this AABB appear in a couple of slides before, and now we'll know exactly what they mean. So collisions in games. Of course, when I talk about collisions, I'm not talking about like hash collisions. I'm talking about objects in our game actually colliding and what we should do when they when they collide. So collision programming in video games typically involves two separate stages. Um, oops, sorry, give me one second. I forgot again to bring up the chat in case there are any questions. So I will do that really quickly. Someone out there just let me know if the mic settings are all right. Should be fine. I think I got it down by this point. Alrighty. So there are two separate stages to collisions in games. The first step is collision detection. So given that we have two moving entities with some sort of given shape or bounds and position, determine if they have collided, meaning essentially determine if they're intersecting somehow. And so detection is a geometric problem. We have two shapes which determine two things in our game, and we are trying to determine whether or not those two things overlap. Collision resolution is a different problem. It's saying, given that we now know that two entities have collided, determine what we want to do to sort of resolve the physics of the simulation. So for example, if my bullet is overlapping or colliding with an enemy, what do I want to now do that I've detected that? Or if my player is colliding with a tile or the floor or a wall or a ceiling, what do I want to actually do now that that person is colliding with that thing or that entity is colliding? So detection is whether or not there is a collision and resolution is, okay, now that I've detected the collision, what do I want to do about that? So we're gonna make some assumptions for these slides and we're going to be using the course definition of entity. So everything we've talked about entity so far. And we are going to uh, also assume that the entities have the following um, properties. So anything that is going to be able to collide needs to have a position. Obviously, it needs to be somewhere for it to be overlapping with something else. It needs to have some sort of bounding shape. Um, in this, circ in this um, lecture, we're going to be talking about rectangles for the most part. And it needs to have some velocity as well, which is the change in X and change in Y position for each frame of the game. So our goal is to learn the mathematics that allows entities to interact in our game. So that's what this lecture is all about. It's about detecting collisions between entities and then resolving collisions between entities. So there are many actual different collision detection problems in games. And some games may actually have a much more complex collision detection problem that then we are going to deal with in this course. So for example, some games may say, given two entities which have a speed, a position, and a bounding shape, determine if they overlap, or when they overlap, or where they will collide, okay? So for example, uh, if I have these two entities right now, do the mathematics to show that they will collide right there. So we are not going to be doing that in this course, um, some problems actually are solved by this. However, this is a bit more of a complex problem and it is not needed for the games we're going to be programming in this course. So if you do go out there and you're, you know, Googling how to do the assignment or whatever, because for some reason you don't like the slides, um, if you see this problem of when and where something will intersect, that is not the problem we're doing in this course, but it does exist. The problem that we're going to be dealing with in this course is the following. So there's two following problems. Given two entities which have a current position only, do they intersect? So I want to know if 
two things intersect. So for example, this rectangle, does that rectangle intersect with this rectangle? Does this circle intersect with this circle? We will not be doing circle rectangle collisions in this course. We don't need need that for this course. And I, I spend enough time on, on the physics stuff as it is. But in this course, we have already done circle circle collisions with assignment two. And so um, in this lecture, we're gonna be talking about rectangle rectangle collisions. And the full form of the problem that we're going to be dealing with in this lecture is given two entities which have a current position, okay? What is the current overlap? So what what is this purple section right here? So if this purple section exists, then there is an overlap. If it doesn't exist, then there's no overlap. And if it does exist, we're going to calculate it and we will know by how much these things overlap. So how much in the x direction, so that's the width of the overlap, and how much in the y direction, which is the height of the overlap. So that's what we're going to learn. By the end of this lecture, you'll know how to do this and you'll know how to resolve those collisions as well for assignment three. Before we get into that math, I want to talk a bit about entity bounding shapes. So in the real world, objects can have arbitrary shapes and interaction surfaces, right? So my hand has this like fairly complex interaction surface. It's, it's like a 3D object. I can like, you know, I can shoot a bullet through here. Nothing will get hurt. Um, it's, it's pretty complex. It's, these are like pretty difficult to store, compute, and simulate accurately and continuously. And of course, there are game engines out there who ha that have really, really great uh, skeleton physics where it could detect something like a bullet going through fingers, but we are not going anywhere near that level of difficulty in this course. So that problem is very difficult to actually take like a real world complex shape and simulate the physics of that. But, no matter how you do simulate that, all shapes in computer simulations must be made out of primitive types. So, you could have, for example, in 2D games, you could have lines, triangles, circles, rectangles. In 3D games, you may have spheres, planes, cylinders, prisms. You could also have curves. I haven't included curves here, but you could have curves as well. And so, a bounding shape concept is that we are going to simulate complex interaction bounds of one shape with a simpler shape, okay? So, for example here, uh, in assignment two, we had shapes like octagons, triangles, pentagons, etc. In assignment three, we are going to have Mega Man. And both of these shapes, they're not that complex, but we are going to be simulating their bounds with a simpler shape. So, for example, in assignment two, we simulated the bounds of this um, octagon with a circle, and we simulate, and we are going to simulate the bounds of this Mega Man with the rectangle that minimally contains it. Okay, so the simplest 2D bounding shape to store and compute is a circle with a given radius. We've already covered circle-circle interactions uh, in a previous lecture, but basically the simplest type of 2D shape interaction is circle-circle, and we've already covered that one. If we talk about other 2D bounding shapes, then pretty much any bounding shape can be constructed with a number of line segments. So if we have line segments, right, we can see whether or not we can do the math to see if the two line segments interact. And then if any of the line segments interact, then those two shapes interact, uh, sorry, uh, overlap. So the simplest possible 2D bounding, but I guess, it, <laughs> The simplest possible bounding box that we're going to be using to encapsulate sort of arbitrary geometry is going to be a rectangle, right? It wouldn't really make sense to make uh, Mega Man a circle uh, because like Mega Man like runs on the ground and has like a flat surface here and a flat surface here. And so we're going to be using a rectangle for that. So before we talk about the math of bounding boxes, we have to talk about how are we going to make, like what is the size of our bounding box? So most 2D games use rectangular sprite graphics, meaning that over here we see Mega Man, for example, my face is cutting, cutting him off a little bit, but that Mega Man that is going to be displayed to the screen is going to be loaded from an image file somehow, right? There's going to be an image file that, de that defines the frames of animation for Mega Man. And so we're going to draw a rectangle around that somehow. 
So these rectangular images um, that are loaded, because all images stored in a computer are rectangular, right? Uh, the, the, the pixels that are non-white may not be rectangular. So for example, we see here this image of Mega Man. Mega Man himself is not rectangular. However, the image that stores those pixels is rectangular. And so it's kind of a natural fit to take a rectangular image and put a rectangular bounding box around it. So usually the bounding box will be the smallest rectangle that fits the sprite so that we can use the texture size as the bounding box size. Meaning that, okay, if this was the image size of Mega Man, then we would probably just take the image size as the bounding box size. But this is not always the case. All right, and I'll show some examples of, of why that may not be the case. So here, for example, um, we have some textures from Mario 1. I know I'm going back really far, but you know, we got to start in the beginning. And so in some cases, this does make sense to just take the image size. And since the tile here fills up the entire image, we are going to take the entire image size as the bounding box. However, Sometimes we can see that the, the image isn't completely full. In this case, Mario actually kind of does fill this entire image, so it's a decent bounding box size. But sometimes the bounding box does not fit the exact bounds of the sprite texture. And why is that? Well, it turns out that when you're making animations for a game, um, your frames of animation, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture when we get into textures and animations, but essentially you want to make one single image size that can fit all of the bounds of all of your animations. And so some of your frames of animation may take up more or less of that bounding box size, okay? So, you know, if we took the bounding box for Mega Man here to be the entire image size, then Mega Man would essentially be hovering over the ground in some, in some frames of animation, and that wouldn't look very good. And so oftentimes we're going to make a custom sized bounding box that is not the exact, si the, not the exact same size or shape as the original image. So for example, in assignment three, when we talk about this specifically, we are going to be using this as the bounding box size, even though it doesn't exactly fit the image size. And it turns out that this is how a lot of video games work. So Mario 1, for example, has some very, very strange bounding box sizes. So you can see here that actually none of the images for the sprites in Mario 1 exactly match their bounding boxes. So for example, Mario's head can go up into a tile. Um, uh, small Mario actually does fit pretty well. And so this is from a, a YouTube video. Um, who made this one? Oh, I can't remember who made this. I should have it on the, on the, on the slide, but he just goes over all the different bounding box sizes and, and ranks them from sort of, you know, fitting the sprite to being really, really strange. So for example, in Mario, uh, the hammers that are thrown, only the left side of this hammer, the top left of that sprite actually damages you. Or the fire, you can actually jump entirely through the second part of the fire um, and not be damaged. And if you ever watch speedruns of Super Mario 1, um, people are sort of jumping through the piranha pr plants. And the reason they're able to jump through the piranha plants is only the base of the plant actually collides with the player. So oftentimes, you know, there are not, uh, the, the bounding box size does not exactly match the sprite size. So axis align bounding boxes. Let's talk about what A, A, B, B are. And by the way, could someone just say something out in the chat if, because no one has said anything so far and I'm kind of worried that the, the broadcast isn't working properly. Normally people just say hello or whatever. I just want to make sure that you can, you can hear me. Um, so axis align bounding boxes. What are those? Okay, thank you. Um, great that it's working. So rectangles in a 2D plane can take any orientation, right? So a rectangle can be rotated in any way, shape or form that you want. 
as long as you still conform to the definition of a rectangle. So all four corners have 90 degree angles. That's it. That's all a rectangle needs to be. It can be rotated however, however you want. So the detecting of intersections of arbitrary rectangles can actually be kind of slow. And it may involve, for example, um, checking to see if all of these line segments, do any of these line segments intersect with any of these line segments or with any of these line segments. And that can actually be a little bit slow. So what we're going to do is we are going to align our bounding boxes with the axes, with the X and Y axis. And by doing that, by aligning our rectangles with the X, Y axis, we can trade arbitrary alignments, meaning we can no longer have rectangles that are rotated like this, but it turns out that that doesn't matter a lot. And what we're going to gain is very, very fast intersection and collision checks. So if we align our bounding boxes to the axis, we get axis aligned bounding boxes. It basically just means rectangles that are not rotated. Okay. So let's talk about some of the physics involved with axis aligned bounding boxes. So the simplest possible check, excuse me, voice cracking. The simplest collision check that we can do with an axis aligned bounding box is to see if a single point lies within an axis aligned bounding box, right? So we're going to have our bounding box over here. And if you think about it, you can specify a rectangle in a number of different ways. Well, actually two main ways. So the first way that you could specify a rectangle um, would be to record the top left position. So X1, Y1 and record the bottom right position X2, Y2. So if you have the top left and the top right, you don't need to include the locations of the other two positions of the rectangle because you could infer them from the original X1 and X2 uh, and Y1 and Y2. So you could also, instead of representing it like this, you could just have the top left point and the width and the top left point and the height. Right? So that would be an equivalent way of storing a rectangle. Um, it's just depending on your, on, your, um, on your use case, it may be easier to do the math if you have uh, a point and a size versus two points. So we'll talk about both of those. So let's talk about a point, P, X1, P, Y1, and detecting whether or not it lies inside a rectangle. So if we do have a point, and again, assuming zero, zero is the top left here, right? So top left is zero, zero, Y going down, uh, Y increases downwards, X increases to the right. So we have a point P and it's inside this rectangle if the following things are true. If PX is greater than X1. So X1 is the left-hand side of the rectangle. So if the X coordinate of the point is to the right of the left hand side of the rectangle, that's the first thing that has to happen. Next, PX has to be less than X2, right? So it has to be between the left side and the right side. Similarly, it has to be above, or sorry, below the top of the rectangle. So the top is Y1. So it has to be greater than that, which in our case is below because Y increases downwards. And it also has to be above the bottom of the rectangle. That's it. So that's, that's how we can do this. If we had completely arbitrary aligned rectangles, we would not be able to do such easy math. So if it's between the left and the right of the rectangle, and it's between the top and the bottom of the rectangle, that is how we know a point is inside a rectangle. So if we instead were, were representing this rectangle by a point and a size, then, okay, we still need to be to the right of the left, right? So we still need to be PX is greater than X. However, now it's just a little bit different. We need to say PX is to the left of the right-hand side and the right-hand side is just X plus width, right? So instead of X2 here, we just have X plus width and we do the same calculation as before. We say, okay, the point has to be below the top, which is this one, and it has to be above the bottom. And this time the bottom Instead of being specified by Y2, it's just Y plus height. 
there you go. So that is point inside axis align bound, bounding box. Very, very simple. The next step, or the next most complicated thing we can do, is to determine if two axis align bounding boxes intersect anywhere. Now, you may think, okay, well, the first way that we may want to consider, if, if you just think about this problem naively, you may think, all right, um, well, in order to detect if two axis align bounding boxes intersect, well, two of their line segments have to be intersecting, right? So that means that I would have to check this line segment against this one, this one, this one, and this one. Then maybe check this one against all four of those, and this one against all four of those, and this one against all four of those. So we're thinking, okay, it might take 16 calculations to see whether or not two axis align bounding boxes intersect. However, we just learned something, which is that we learned how to detect if a point is within a rectangle. So now we may just want to check, for example, whether or not, okay, we have four points here. We have this one, this one, this one, and this one. So maybe we say, well, look at this, they're overlapping if this one is inside the other rectangle, right? That's an overlap. However, this shortcut does not work because if our rectangle instead went up here like this, this there would be these two rectangles would be overlapping, but none of the corners would actually be inside the other rectangle. So unfortunately, we can't use this to detect rectangle intersection. So you may say, Oh, well, it looks like we're going to be stuck using those um, 16 different calculations, and that's going to be very slow. But it turns out that that is not the case, and we can use a really cool mathematical shortcut that is much easier to compute to detect the intersection of two axis align bounding boxes. So let's go through the derivation of that. I could just, on the next form, like, I could cut this lecture down to like five minutes if all I did was give you the formula, but I want you to understand how it works. So we're going to derive that formula now. Let's talk about different types of overlap because this will actually be important. So first, let's talk about horizontal overlap. So horizontal overlap occurs if the top of each box is higher than the bottom of the other box. So what does that mean? Well, horizontal overlap means if I can draw a straight horizontal line that goes through both rectangles or touches both rectangles, then there is horizontal overlap between them. And, you know, you could think of a number of different ways to try and detect this. However, there's a really cool, easy way to detect this. So it says, if the top of each box is higher than the bottom of the other box, then there's a horizontal overlap. So what does that mean? Well, it says if the top of this box is higher than the bottom of this box and the top of this box is higher than the bottom of this box, it means that there's a horizontal overlap. So I'll give you a second, maybe just pause the video and think about that for a bit, but it is true, right? That, that's a, that is a fact. And that is a shortcut that we can use to do this calculation. So, if we have two rectangles uh, specified by x1, y1 as the top left of one rectangle, as well as the width and height, and then the same thing for the second rectangle, so we have x2, y2, and h2, w2, there is going to be a horizontal overlap. And I said again, if the top of each rectangle is above the bottom of the other rectangle. So there is a horizontal overlap if y1 which is the top of the green rectangle over here, is above, meaning less than in our coordinate system. So if y1 is less than this line, which is y2 plus h2, and this line is above this line. So if y2 is less than, because this is our coordinate system, y1 plus h1. Okay, so that means there is horizontal overlap 
if these conditions are true. It's a really cool shortcut. Let's do the opposite of that now. Vertical overlap. Vertical overlap occurs if the left of each box is less than the right of the other box. And just like horizontal overlap me meant that I could draw a single horizontal line between both rectangles, vertical overlap means that there is a single hor vertical line that goes through both rectangles. So let's do that same calculation. So there is a vertical overlap if the left hand side of box one is to the left of the right hand side of box two, okay? So x1 is the left of this box, x2 plus width is the right hand side of this box. So if x1 is less than x2 plus w2, right? That means that this is to the left of this. And also, if the left hand side of the other box is to the left of the first box, okay? So if x2, which is this x coordinate, is less than x1 plus w1. So that is how we detect vertical overlap. And now, watch this, two axis aligned bounding boxes intersect if they overlap horizontally and vertically. That's it. <laughs> so this problem, which we thought was going to like involve computing 16 different line intersections, is now just the end of the two things that we just did. So axis aligned bounding boxes intersect if they overlap vertically, which is this calculation right here, and they overlap horizontally, which is this calculation right here. That's it. Look at how fast that is. Isn't that crazy? Excuse me, I'm very thirsty today. Okay, so that's it. That's axis aligned bounding boxes. And if I just gave you this slide, you may not really understand what's going on without the previous few slides. So that tells us if two bounding boxes intersect, but it doesn't tell us by how much they intersect, right? And um, we're going to want to know how much they intersect in order to do a bunch of the calculations in our game engine. So, excuse me. Centered AABB intersection. So in our game engine, in order to make some calculations very, very easy, and we'll get into that as the course goes on, we are actually going to be storing our rectangles by the center of the rectangle rather than the, um, the top left of the rectangle, okay? So this is actually how we're going to be storing our rectangles in assignment three and assignment four by the center of the rectangle. So how are we going to calculate overlapping area for center positioned axis aligned bounding boxes? So let's do that. Here, we're going to have x, y in the center of the rectangle and width height up here. Now, how is this going to be stored in our game engine? Well, we're going to have something like this. We are going to have um, the transform, okay? So this is the transform component that we're going to have in our game engine. It's going to have a position. Uh, we're going to have a previous position. I'll talk about that in a second. It's going to have a scale. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. And it's going to have a, this is actually supposed to say velocity. So the speed in the X and Y direction is actually the velocity. Apologize for that typo. And then we're going to have a bounding box, which is going to store the size of the bounding box. So the size in the X direction and the size in the Y direction, okay? And so the position is the center of the rectangle and the size is the bounding box size. We are also, for convenience, going to be storing this half size thing as well. So rather, like a lot of our computations are going to involve the half size of something, meaning half of the X and half of the Y. So rather than um, like constantly compute size over two, size over two, size over two, we are just gonna compute that once and store it because that is not a significant amount of memory. So we are going to be using this half size in our calculations and I'll show you how that happens now. But just keep in mind that we are going to have the following scenario where we have one rectangle 
represented by x1, y1, and another rectangle represented by x2, y2. And they are each going to have a width and a height. So how are we going to determine if they are overlapping with this formula and by how much they are overlapping? Well, let's take, again, the horizontal overlap first, okay? So if we look at this example, we're going to compute dx. So dx is the difference in x values between the two rectangles. And because we're not sure which rectangle is to the left, which rectangle is to the right, we're going to subtract their two values and then take the absolute value, right? So the absolute value meaning the distance between these two values. Uh, if we didn't take the absolute value, we may have a negative number and you can't have like negative distance like that. So we're taking the absolute value of this. So if we look at this and then Let's look at those two values. So the width divided by two of both of these values, right? So we can see here that these rectangles do not overlap in this direction, right? Because if they did, we would have a situation like this, where those two width over twos, the sum of these was greater than dx, right? So here, the two rectangles are not overlapping, but here they are overlapping. So here, no overlap in the X direction. Here, yes overlap in the X direction. See how that works? So again, this just comes from this slide here and I'm translating it to its own slide without the rest of the rectangles there. So we have overlap in the X direction with the following calculation. If we take width, width two over two, plus width one over two, and then subtract dx, that is going to be positive if there is an overlap in the x direction, right? So look at this, this is these widths. If these two summed are longer than dx, then it means there's an overlap. So it means that this calculation will be positive if there is an overlap in the x direction. Now, let's do the same thing in the y direction. So in the y direction, we are going to do dy, which subtracts both of these, okay, and takes the absolute value. And then we're going to take the half heights of each of our shapes and do the exact same calculation as we did before. So these, this is a situation where they are not overlapping in the y direction, right? So we have uh, h, uh, the, the heights divided by two, if they were overlapping, we would have a situation like this, right? Not overlapping, yes overlapping. So if we add up the halves of both heights and subtract the difference in y, then we have a positive, if this is positive, then we have a y overlap, all right? So let's put all of that together in one slide. We have rectangle one and rectangle two. We are calculating this overlap X and overlap Y, OX and OY value. So we're going to take this delta. This delta is the absolute value of the differences of both the X and the Y. So that is the distance between the, the centers of the two rectangles, right? So now we're going to calculate OX, which is that value that we calculated before, which is width, or width one divided by two plus width two divided by two minus delta dot X and we do the same thing for OY. And so the overlap is just OX, OY. And if either of those are negative, it means that the rectangles are not overlapping. So if the overlap in the X direction is negative, it means that there is a separation, right? Because if we look back here, if we add, there's a separation here, right? So if we add this width over two and this width over two and subtract dx, we're going to get a negative value, meaning there's no overlap. Similarly, the same thing with the height. Here we will have a negative value if there's no overlap. So if ox and oy are both positive, then we know there is an overlap between these two rectangles. Okay, so rather than have four if statements saying whether or not we're overlapping, we have this math down here, and this math also gives us the exact value of the, of the overlapping area. So now we can do something with that, 
And the thing we are going to do with that is resolve collisions. So now that we've detected an AABB collision and we know by like how much of a collision there is, what are we going to do? Well, the resolution of collisions is going to depend entirely on what the physics of your world are, right? So for example, if a player collides with a tile, maybe it should be like pushed out of the tile so that, that it doesn't overlap. Like if that's just like kind of like real world physics, right? I can't have two objects which overlap in a plane. So if Mario is running to the left and we see that, okay, now he's overlapping with a tile, maybe we somehow resolve that. So here's an example. Let's say that we have some stationary object over here, like a tile or a wall or a floor or whatever. And we have some entity over here. These are the bounding boxes of both of these entities. So on each frame, this entity is going to be moving to the left by some amount, right? So this is the X velocity, the VX of this, um, of this entity. So on the next frame, it's going to go from here to here, right? See how that works? It has some velocity. It's going to go from here to there. Now, in a video game, there is no continuous movement. You cannot have continuous movement in a video game. What looks like continuous movement to our eyes is an optical illusion, right? On every frame of the game, everything is actually stationary, right? It's at this location. It is being drawn stationary right there on the screen. And then on the next frame, we have some speed value, which we add to the position. And then it is at a new position on a new frame. So it's like, it's warping, right? Like it's here, then it's here, then it's here. So it's, it's warping from one place to another, from one frame to another. There is no way around that, right? We have a discrete universe that has to be moved in discrete chunks. So on frame one, it might be here. On frame two, it's here. On frame three, it's here, four, it's here, keeps moving. And then at some point, it is overlapping with a thing, right? So a collision has now been detected. So on every frame, we are saying, is there a collision? No. Is there a collision? No. Is there a collision? Yes. So if this happens, what might we want to do? Well, the physics of our universe may tell us a bunch of different things that we could do. For example, if this green thing was a bullet, maybe we just want to destroy the bullet, right? If a bullet collides with a tile, the bullet is destroyed. So that's the easiest possible resolution case is where we just say, okay, two things have collided, destroy one or more of them. No longer worry about the problem. But if this is our protagonist and they ran into a wall, maybe we don't want them to just die. Maybe they lose some health but we want them to basically just show something realistic, which is running into the wall, but not actually overlapping the wall. So in this case, what we would want to do of like Mario running into a wall is on one frame, Mario is on to the right of the wall. The next frame, Mario is overlapping with the wall. And so what we are going to do is a very, very simple resolution is where we are going to take the greens position and we are going to add the overlap. Right? So we look at this overlap and we say, oh, look at this. There's, a, there's an overlap in the X direction. So what do I want to do? I want to take this, uh, let me get my pen up. I want to take this overlap value and just shift this green one to the right by that overlap value so that now this is what I see. Okay? That makes sense. We want it to go toward the wall, but not actually enter the wall. So what you see in the video game is on frame two, three, four, five, right? We detect the collision and then we also move it before we display it. So you see down here in the bottom left, like frame five hasn't changed. That's because there's a collision detection step and a resolution step before the rendering step. So the player never actually sees Mario go into the wall even though for that split second, Mario was inside the wall. And then on the next frame, Mario goes into the wall again and gets pushed out again. Mario goes into the wall again and gets pushed out again. So it's actually funny, like on every frame that you're running at a certain speed, you actually are going into the wall and then getting pushed out. 
Going in, getting pushed out. Going in, getting pushed out. Now, yes, I understand that there could be a physics system that instead of going into the wall and then getting pushed out, somehow detects maybe how far there is to go and then, like, and then only allows the thing to move that... that that's very. That's a very complex calculation, it turns out. And so what most game engines do is just allow the overlap for a split second and then resolve the overlap. We have the overlap, resolve the overlap. Have the overlap, resolve the overlap. Okay, so that's, that's what's going on. That's it. Now you know how to do that. You just add the overlap. However, it can get a little bit tricky. So here are some of the tricky cases. What if, like in this case, we had, okay, it's pretty obvious that this thing is coming from the right and it should just be pushed out to the right. But what if we have this case where this object is moving to the left and something like this happens? Now what do we do? What would we do here if it's overlapping at a corner like this? Well, again, there are options. And the options depend on the context of your world and what you want to happen. So, if we, if we did what we just did before, so in this case, all we did was we took the overlap and we added it, right? That, that wouldn't work here because if we took the overlap and we added it, we'd end up with this. I don't think in any physics situation we would want to end up with this, where the player is moving do, 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 and then, and then it ends up like that. That's, that's really strange. So I think that would be kind of bad physics. We wouldn't want that to happen. So we have options. In the first option, maybe we want to push it upwards, right? So that might be the case if we like, for example, are, are doing some stairs or something like that. Let's say, for example, that we have stairs like this. And when someone comes from the right, and there's not a significant overlap in the horizontal direction, we actually want to push them up so that they can keep going up the stairs. That might be an option, okay? Uh, maybe, so, so this is what would happen there, right? In that case, we would go left, 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 and then we would push them up. So that could be something that we want to happen. However, maybe what we want to do is go like this, left, 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 and then stop there so that it collides with it. I think in most cases, this is sort of what you want to do. I think like stairs are the only case where you wouldn't want to do this. So if you have like two things in the real world, which are overlapping, uh, like my fist and my phone, right? And they sort of come in together like this. They're actually colliding right there. Even if there's only like a millimeter of space where they're colliding, they still just kind of stop. Right? So maybe in this case, if something was coming from the right, if it was moving left, then we want it to stop in the horizontal direction and not be pushed up. So how would we do that? So when detecting collisions in our game, they're going to first happen on a specific frame, right? So the frame before the collision, there is no collision. And then on the frame of the collision, there is the collision. So maybe what we could do is let's try and use the overlap to determine which direction the movement come from, came from. So this is the first try. Let's just say, okay, um, there's an overlap. Let's just use the overlap to determine what we should do. For example, could we use the overlap to determine where the object came from? Well, in this case, for example, where do you think this object came from? So if this green object was moving, where did it come from if this is the collision? Well, it could have come from the top, right? It could have been moving down from the top like this, and then on the next frame, it was inside this block. Or it could have come from this direction. We're not sure. If all we try and do is use the value of the overlap, we cannot actually truly detect the direction of movement, right? So what I propose, and there are a number of different ways to do this, is use the previous overlap to detect direction. So what does that mean? It means that if a previous frame's overlap 
was greater than zero in the y direction, then the movement came horizontally. So we can resolve the collision by pushing in the x direction. So this is what we talked about. This is one of those horizontal collisions, right? Or a horizontal overlap. So if on the frame before the overlap, but for, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. If on the frame before the collision, you detected a Y overlap, then you know it was horizontal movement. So it'll go like this, right? So on the, on the frame of the collision, we have overlap in both X and Y. So this is the collision frame. The frame before the collision, if there was overlap in Y, it means that we know it was horizontal directional movement. Okay? So, in this case, we're going to resolve the collision by pushing in the X direction. See how that works? So if we came from the right, we're going to stop the movement horizontally. If the opposite happens, where something is moving vertically, then on the frame before the collision, there is only overlap in the X direction. And so if that's the case, we resolve the collision by pushing it in the Y direction. See how that works? So a collision, we know now which direction to push things in because now we know if things were coming from the side or if things were coming from the top or sorry, from, we know if they were coming horizontally or vertically. So a collision came from the top if it had a previous overlap X greater than zero and its Y value is higher, right? So that means that I know if I'm coming from the top. Now, why would I need to know if I'm coming from the top? Well, it turns out if you think about a game like Mario, if I come from the top, direction, I want to actually, like if, if this green thing comes from the top, moving downward, maybe this is Mario and I just want to land on this tile and not do anything. But if I'm coming from the bottom and going upwards, this might be Mario hitting a question mark block. So there may be different physics depending on the direction that you came from as well, right? So in assignment three, you will have to do something different based on whether or not you came from the top being overlap in the X direction was greater than zero and its Y direction is higher, meaning actually less than. And similarly, coming from the bottom is the overlap in the X direction and Y is lower or actually greater than in this, in this case. One last tricky case. What if the previous frame overlap had, the, what if the previous frame before the collision had no overlap in the X or the Y direction. So for example, if I'm coming in diagonally like this, and now there's an overlap, how would I determine that? There's no overlap on the previous frame, and now there is overlap on the previous frame. So we must decide somehow how to resolve collisions based on that, right? So for example, I think in my engine, it just defaults to pushing it to the side rather than the top. Like you can decide on this, um, and test it in your engine and see how you prefer to do that. So, what if, here's another case, what if an entity overlaps with multiple entities? So for example, if you have a stack of tiles that represent a wall and you're moving to the left, how do you resolve this case? Well, it turns out that the order of collision checks may determine what, what happens, right? So, it could be tricky, but usually the previous overlap method discussed here um, resolves this case. And so if you use that previous overlap position, then what will happen is if you are coming from the left, no matter which of these you collide with, it's going to push it back out to the right. See? because of the way that we use the previous overlap in the, in the first, in those previous slides. So that's why I taught it to you this way, because if we hadn't used previous overlap and we only used previous position, then this may actually be a case where this, like this tile would want you to push it up. This one would want you to push it right. And none of them are agreeing on what to do. So that's, that's why I taught it to you in this way.
So the order of collision checks um, may decide which resolution occurs, but if we use the previous overlap method, we kind of solve this problem. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. And an important note, all collision resolution discussed here is for the simple case of avoiding overlap. So for example, it's very useful for walking on tiles, being able to pass through tiles, bullet hits entity, etc. But many, many other kinds of collisions can actually occur in games. So there could be um, like, so our kinematics in our game, our actual physics, we are assuming that they are inelastic, right? So one object is kind of fixed. They're not bouncing off of each other. So we're just saying that like one object kind of has like infinite mass and another one walks up to it and just gets stopped, okay? That is what we are doing in this, in this course. We are not getting into really advanced physics where like one thing would bounce and then they'd kind of like bounce off of each other. We're not going to go into that, but just realize that these physics are for resolving that sort of, you know, okay, tiles in our game are sort of immutable. They cannot be moved by the player when they collide. So that's how we're going to do these things is saying, okay, the player moved into the tile, the tile stays put and the player collides with it. Um, but there, just realize that there are physics simulators out there with forces and masses, etc., etc., And you could see something different in another physics engine than what we are doing. There's not one way to do this. I am just teaching you the way that I would want you to, to implement on our assignment. As a note, um, this is not how Super Mario Brothers works. So the original Super Mario Brothers actually made some really cool optimizations that end up in some behavior that you may or may not want in your actual um, in your actual game. So Super Mario Brothers collisions operated slightly differently. Consider the case of Mario jumping on top of an entity. How is that detected? So the same axis align bounding box overlap is used. However, what Mario does is it just says, is Mario moving downward? And if Mario is moving downward when they overlap, then it doesn't matter where, where the two objects are. So this is what I mean by that. So Mario has a bounding box here and the Goomba has a bounding box here. So if Mario's Y velocity is negative, meaning it's moving downwards. When these two things overlap, then it doesn't matter if Mario is actually coming from above the Goomba or the side of the Goomba. So in both of these cases, if they overlap, as long as Mario is moving downward, the Goomba will be killed in both of these cases. So here, Here's where you would sort of think, yes, okay, that the Goomba should be killed, but maybe here, Mario should not kill the Goomba because he's moving downward. But in Mario, it just does two checks. It says, first, are the bounding boxes overlapping? If they are, it checks to see, is the Y direction of Mario going down? If it is, then the kill occurs. So you can get some really, really interesting jumps and bounces in Mario if, um, like if this sort of situation occurs because of the shortcut that they're doing in their physics. We will not be doing that shortcut in our physics. However, maybe your gameplay becomes really interesting if you do do it this way, right? So their shortcut actually made for some really cool physics in the original Super Mario Brothers. I have some recommended videos here, um, especially this middle one, um, walls, floors, and ceilings. So all of these videos talk about the physics of collisions in video games. Um, specifically, this one talks about Super Mario Brothers 1. So Bismuth. Bismuth is the one who, who show, I had that, uh, I couldn't remember the um, YouTuber who made the, the image that I showed. Bismuth made that. So that comes from this video. I recommend watching that video. Like, I know that you, a lot of people won't, but if you watch all three of these videos, you will be entertained and amazed if you have never seen them before. They are not required for this course, but what you will see is that even if you are Nintendo, like a AAA game designer, so in Super Mario Brothers 1, they still have physics problems. In Super Mario 64, 
this so this is about a 3D game engine, but this video is absolutely fascinating, and it talks about how um, Super Mario Brothers, sorry, Super Mario 64 for the N64 does is its physics collisions. It's completely different than what we're doing in this course. It's it's way more complex, but it's a 3D game. But it is absolutely fascinating how they do it. So I recommend watching these videos. And that's it for today. So a couple of lectures this term went over time. This one went under time. And so that's the trade-off that is possible when you use um, remote lectures. So that's pretty cool. So let's go back here for a second. Uh, in the next lecture, we will be talking about sprites, textures, and animations. So how we will be loading textures, creating animations, and displaying those within our game engine for assignment three. So thank you all for tuning in. This was a bit of a short one, but uh, they don't all have to be super long, right? Cool. I will see you on the next lecture, and uh, thanks for watching.